Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mission Control, a podcast focusing on executive directors and how they strive to make positive impacts in their communities. I'm your host, Paul J. Schmidt, owner and creative video strategist for Introduce Multimedia. And I'm here today with my great friend, Julie Powers of the, let me get it, let me get it, Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation. Did I get it? Good job. You did All great. Right. So that's awesome. Well, <laughs> Well, like I try to start at, um, oh, and this is the season opener. This is the season opener of season three, and cool. welcome to be my first guest on season three. And so how I like to start these is as the proprietor, well, maybe proprietor is the wrong word, but the ED CEO, president of the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation, or as we like to call it, at introduce MESO. M E S O to, to abbreviate. That's what right. is your what is your mission statement? What what is what, what is what you do? Our mission is we are dedicated to supporting patients and their families throughout their mesothelioma experience. Uh, as the only nonprofit organization committed to improving patient outcomes through mesothelioma research, we collaborate with scientists and clinicians by funding research and advocating for federal appropriations. That's awesome. That's a lot. It's a big job, um, but our overall goal is to help pe patients with mesothelioma, mesothelioma live longer and better lives. Um, but we, yeah, it's a it's one of the one of if not the most deadly cancer, and it's also an ultra rare. So it's a little bit of a niche, um, but um, but lots of people have someone in their lives who they love who's been affected by mesothelioma, and we're here to help. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, um, my wife's grandfather had it for and was part of a class action suit and all that other stuff that mm -hmm. I, I didn't really know a lot about it. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the disease? I know you get this a lot, but <laughs> for this audience, they might not they might have heard it, but they don't sure. really know what the disease actually is. So mesothelioma is, uh, it's a deadly cancer and it's caused, uh, it, the only known cause of mesothelioma um, or, you know, studied and verified cause of mesothelioma is exposure to asbestos. And unfortunately it can be one fiber one time. So um, a lot of folks, um, 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 asbestos has been used, it's a great insulator and it's been used for for more than a century. Um, it was uh, primarily used, it was, it was initially mined in Libby, Montana, um, and it was, it was used in shipyards, um, and it's been used in brakes. You found it in brake pads. Um, it's been used um, uh, in tiles, um, and, and it was a great way to, as a fire barrier. Um, uh, lots of furnaces and other, like, heating and cooling apparatus were wrapped in it um, because it was a great way to keep he, he, you know, th hot things hot and cold things cold. Um, so people who worked in those industries were usually the first ones exposed. Plumbers, pipe fitters, ship builders, ship breakers, um, uh, folks who worked on submarines, military service. Um, I'm the granddaughter of a Navy. Uh, and, uh, you know, my grandfather's passed now, but um, he served in the Navy. He was on subs and on ships, and he was certainly exposed. Um, my uncle also served in the Navy, same, same. But again, it's one fiber one time, but not everybody gets it. And it's super rare, so about 3,000 people a year. It is almost entirely deadly. The, um, the challenge with mesothelioma is that um, from the time you get exposed to the asbestos and the time you develop the disease, it's somewhere between, it's like 30, 40, 50 years. Um, so you could have been exposed as a young adult in military service or working in a break shop or working on the line at a, 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 in a plant or as a journeyman electrician. Um, and, you know, do you remember what you were doing 30 years ago? <laughs> 30 years ago? Mm. 40 years ago? Yeah. I mean, so the latency period can make it really difficult to diagnose. But as you mentioned, um, Elisa's uh, grandfather 
uh, had mezo and um, was involved in a class action lawsuit. And a lot of folks hear about mesothelioma and actually know how to spell it and know it's a cancer because they see TV ads. And those are lawyers. Those are folks who are um, uh, seeking to get people involved in lawsuits. Um, we stay out of that. We don't refer people to lawyers. Um, it is certainly my personal opinion that everyone has a right to legal counsel and should consult a lawyer, but you should do so at the same time that you consult with a qualified mesothelioma expert. And the sad reality is, is that there just aren't enough centers um, where there are um, experts who know how to diagnose and then treat mesothelioma. Mm. But the average patient is diagnosed at 72 and dies at 74. And right now mm. it's white men because think about it 40 or 50 years ago <laughs> who were in the navy who were serving on subs who were working in ship building who were working in plants um but you know um the fastest growing growing group of people um to have mesothelium are women um mm. and we're just now there was a report put out by the cdc fairly recently that talked about how quickly that group is growing whereas the men are starting to slight taper off so while we're very grateful that fewer and fewer men are dying from mesothelioma, it is a bit alarming to know that so many more women will die. And women, it presents differently, or it can present differently. But mesothelioma ends up primarily in the pleural space, so in your lungs, the lining of your lungs, um, um, or the peritoneal space, which is your abdomen. There are some other extremely rare iterations of it, which we don't need to go into, but that's like 72 and 18 or, or 15 percent of the cases the rest are just a, a few here and there but um but yeah folks who get it you know i mean the survival rates um vary um and in our disease we don't measure it in like five year survival rates we do it by year mm, okay yeah well i'm gonna go a little bit into why or how did this how did this role find you how, how did you how did you land in this position? Great question. Um, so, uh, gosh, five years ago, um, I took a job in the D.C. area, um, just outside of D.C. Uh, in Montgomery County in Maryland, um, working for another rare disease organization that focused on, on bone marrow failure. I took a job as the number two um, and learned a lot really fast. Um, about rare disease, um, about the ultra rares, and about how funding works, um, how you can partner with industry, how you can partner with government to advance uh, curative treatments or better manage symptoms um, and extend life, and the importance of investing concurrently in research and then in patient and family services. Now, in the bone marrow failure space um, and in the organization I was working in, um, over the course of just the time, from the time I got there till the time I left, um, uh, uh, stem cell transplant kind of became the norm for the treatment for that and has really in, um, improved survivability to the point where many bone marrow failure diseases are actually chronic illnesses. There's a ton, but that's what happens when you pour tons of research into diseases and what happens when, you know, you're dealing with you know, you're, you're dealing with, with, with folks who have good medical coverage and these were mostly elders and they all have Medicare. So um, you can get treatment when you're on Medicare. <laughs> um, so, uh, but there's also in that disease space, there was also a linkage to military service. Um, um, one of the bone marrow failure diseases, which people may have heard of called MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome, there is a strong link between exposure to Agent Orange and other chemicals. Um, particularly those who served in Vietnam. And so um, there's a lot of military uh, DOD investment into research. So that's how I learned more about mesothelioma because we were in the same group of advocates advocating mm. for more funding from the military into the, a, a set of diseases that are affecting their uh, military veterans and their families, as well as some war fighters. So um, and that's how I learned about mesothelioma. My predecessor, Mary, um, had been with the foundation for ages, more than a decade. Um, she served two roles as the chief medical officer and also as the executive director. She's a nurse practitioner, and most of the mesothelioma experts who were working today actually worked with her at some point or another, or she, <laughs> she encouraged them to participate. But I got to know Mary as an advocate, and um, we were doing a lot of advocacy work together um, in group formats, and um, I was a little salty about an issue. Um, I know you're surprised to hear that I might get a little <laughs> salty. And um, uh, she said, I like you. And so when the um, 
when she decided it was finally time for her to retire, she suggested that I might be a good candidate. I interviewed with the board and I had the job two weeks later. Wow. Well, well, I mean, it's a really tiny universe of people who have experience working in the rare disease world and who have as many years as I do in the nonprofit sector. So it was right time, right, right place, but right person. I, at least I think so. Um, plus, you know, I mean, this is a heck of a group. You know, we do so we do amazing work. And I know your team got to meet meet my crew uh, last summer. And and uh, yeah, we work hard. Um, <laughs> well, um, so you went from one rare disease advocacy organization to another. Is there a draw there or is that just plain luck that you were able to 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 land in these organizations? I knew that it was time. I wanted to go back to being the boss. I've run other nonprofit organizations, um, I, you know, and and and. I knew it was time to go do that. Um, there was some transition happening at my other rare disease organization, and I didn't want to run it. I didn't have the heart for it. They needed someone else to be that person, so it was time. So it was, it was one of those things. It was time to move on, move up. Um, but also, um, there, so there are cancer advocacy organizations that do what we do: fund research, patient family services. Kind of, we all wear those same hats, and advocacy as well. So there's kind of a small group of us. I mean, there's hundreds of cancer charities, but there's probably only 50 that do what we do. And every now and then, you know, to everything, there is a season, right? It feels like there's a little bit of a roulette wheel that gets spun and everybody moves around. (laughs) Um, And so since I've gotten, um, we have a a private group of cancer CEOs um, that I got invited to. And it's interesting to watch. Um, Someone will leave and they'll go work in academia or they'll go out and do some consulting and someone else in the group will move from rare disease organization to another one. But the thing is, once you get into this rare disease world, the niche knowledge that we have to have is ridiculous. Not only do we have to run a nonprofit, but we also have to understand how CMS works. We have to understand how pricing is managed. We also have to have a really good working knowledge of pharmaceutical industry regulations. And we also need to understand the legalities. I'm doing contracts all the time, you know, and then I get to do stuff like talk to you and run symposia and speak to, uh, you know, to college groups about cancer biology, something by which I should note, I am not qualified to do. I get briefed by our um, patient services director, who's an oncology nurse. And then I just say what she tells me. Um, or by our, our science advisory board and the members of our board who are MDs or MD PhDs. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at, at doing the people part um, and then reading the science part. Yeah, so, it's, it, it's, it's a weird needle to thread, but I would say that the universe of people who do like the rares and are really interested in the rares um, is pretty small. But what's neat is a lot of these organizations, especially the larger cancer organizations, they will have staff in the like manager director level who will eventually take over for us, mm. which is great because then I'll go do something else. But that's it, cool. Yeah, but I also need to say that this job is not for the weak, and this job is not for the people who are unaware of the secondhand trauma and, and that comes from being exposed to grief. Because I know I hit on it when we first started talking, but the reality is is that almost all of our patients will die. Um, some of natural causes, because most people are diagnosed as elders, um, but the reality is, is that the the survival rate for mesothelioma is 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 very very small, um, and so um, but you have to be you have to have those resources in place. You know, you have to have a therapist. You, you can't get through this without it. Um, you have to be really good at compartmentalizing, and you have to be really good in con- almost constant, potentially constant crisis. But it doesn't mean that I don't want to, I don't want to scare people off, but I want people to understand that, that this is not the job for everybody. Um, and anybody who's watching this or listening to this, who knows me, um, I'm okay in a crisis. It's just afterwards that I fall apart. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think that that's uh, the most key part is uh, be able to have it together in the middle, in the midst of the crisis and uh, waiting till after it abates for you to be like, Okay, I'm done right now. Yes. So that's that's yes. good to know that space. <laughs> and speaking of knowing spaces, um, you you as um, you know executive level with two uh, uh, 
advocacy, cancer advocacy organizations, but I've known you for a while and I've known you to be an executive director or at least um, upper level in various nonprofits that cover various of uh, um, areas. Uh, mm -hmm. Why are you drawn to the nonprofit space in general? I mean, I know where you're drawn to this work in particular, right. but this has been your, your, your life and you've been kind of in this leadership position for quite some time in different regions mm -hmm. uh, and different organizations and such. What, what is it about the nonprofit work for you? That, that's a great question. And um, I have, <laughs> you know, I, I joke, and especially when I talk to student groups, they always ask that. And, and I tell them the same thing that I'll tell you, which is that um, I, when I was, I don't even know, I think I was in junior high, I, I found my people, if you will, in, in theater, doing community theater. Um, I realized I found folks who aligned with me. We had similar values. We had similar work ethics. Uh, the show must go on kind of attitude. Um, we will make it work um, no matter what and um, never let them see you sweat. All those like cliche phrases. And so then I had um, I'd worked a couple jobs after I got out of college and they just were not doing it for me. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go to grad school because that's, of course, what you're going to do is go to grad school in the middle of a recession. Right. OK, let's go. Um <laughs> And I started a part-time job. And on my first day, my new boss at, at a state association where um, it was a part-time 20-hour a week job, I walked in the door and met, you know, met the woman who hired me. And she said, so this is going to be a full-time job now. The pay is some pittance amount of money. And oh, by the way, we have a huge grant due on Friday that's going to fund this organization for the next five years. Can you tackle that? And being the intrepid theater kid, because of course the show must go on. And, um, and being an alumna of Alma College, where liberal arts says, you can write anything um, <laughs> for any reason about anything for at least 10 pages. Um, and I said, sure. Okay, let's go. And um, after about a week of frantically talking to anyone, this was before the internet, kids, um, talking to everybody who would listen to me, um, uh, having coffee with like four state employees off the record who they were just mentoring this 20 something year old kid who didn't know what she was doing. I submitted the grant, we got the grant and it started. And I realized, Hey, this is cool. Like this is, this is cool because I could see that the work that I put in on the front end meant this amazing work that could happen on the back end. So at the time it was a weatherization grant that would result in elders and folks who were experiencing, who had limited resources, be able to get their homes made more energy efficient to get through a cold Michigan winter. So it appealed to my like little heart of, uh, but you know, so that started and I spent seven years doing that work and I learned so much and I, I worked for a couple of different leaders. I had, um, I had some mentorship. Um, I also probably worked in what most people would describe as pretty toxic surroundings, you know, terrible people doing terrible things because elected officials are terrible people sometimes. Um, um, and, and we didn't have any money. All we had were our voices, but you know, I, I guess, uh, I guess I've always tilted at windmills. And uh, here we are. Um, that was in 1996. And so, yeah, this is my 27th year in the nonprofit sector. Wow. Yeah. So, so what, what are, what is like a story over the last 27 years, over the various <laughs> situations you've been in that sticks out that this was like, you know what, this will always stay with me. Oh gosh, there are too many to, too many to tell and some of which I, I, I've been sworn to secrecy on. Um, but um, I think, you know, there were a couple. One is the really the power of the people. Um, that if you give, if, if there is a great injustice and you need for our elected officials to hear from the people that they're affecting, um, there was a movement afoot to um, cancel um, which is which was the companion program. So I was working for Community Action, and Head Start is a key program of Community Action. And the Head Start funding was secure, but Michigan had a program called the Michigan School Readiness Program, which provided really great supportive pre-K programming for kids, especially kids who came from families that had limited um, resources or who had been denied access to really to to good resources, especially for education for their children. And um, Again, this is before the days of the internet. We dealt in faxes and phones and, and snail mail. Um, but we, um, 
we we knew we couldn't mobilize and get all of the parents of of these children of pre what's what's now zero uh, you know uh, what is it zero to five. Um, programming, um, we knew we couldn't get everybody physically to the Capitol. So we put the call out and we got as many as we could. We had buses and buses of parents with strollers and, 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 and then, um, but what we did was um, we organized a faxing campaign to every single member of the Michigan House and Senate. And at about 11 o'clock that morning, because we started at eight and at 11 o'clock, we got the stop. We get the point. We will fix it. And then they did. Um, <laughs> I mean, sometimes we don't have money and you don't have that kind of power. Sometimes the only thing you have is numbers and voice. And so we were able to elevate the voice of, of, of people. Um, and then I think maybe the most recent win that we've had is, um, I don't know, it, it, for folks who, who follow along in, 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 in the um, shenanigans of our federally elected officials, um, I should note that there are some really great federal elected officials on both sides of the aisle. This is not a partisan thing. Um, but we get a lot of funding funneled into mesothelioma research and research for um, cancers that can be tied to military service or that disproportionately affect um, warfighters and veterans or their families. So for example, funding for traumatic brain injuries, um, for folks who have been exposed to like the burn pits, um, and in our case, mesothelioma because of the direct tie to Navy, mostly Navy service. Um, and because what happens when there's a continuing resolution is anything that's extra to the budget that is funded outside of the president's budget that gets hammered away at and ultimately passed, anything that's extra to that outside of it is not funded. It gets put on a hold. And the money that we that are is invested into these kinds of researches, research, particularly um, anything from the Department of Defense, that gets put on pause. Um, and so um, we did a lot of 11th hour um, phone calls, emails. Um, there were some hill visits, not a lot though. Um, but we we we've been part. We're part of coalitions, and we were able to get a hold of some of the folks who were holding out on passing the budget and passing this extra to the budget piece um, to ensure that we were able to continue the funding um, for the congressionally directed medical research program. Now it's kind of niche, right? Like that's our little our little tiny corner of the universe. Um, but um, folks don't necessarily understand how how budgets work at the federal level. I didn't. I, I've had a crash course in it the last five years. Um, I mean, I knew peripherally and I had a fairly decent working understanding, um, but more than the schoolhouse rock version, but not a whole lot more. But, you know, now, I mean, I, I, I'm an amateur compared to the pros who work on the Hill, but, um, but I know where we can be that inflection point. Um, a lot of our patients or their um, their spouses who've experienced they're the bereaved, um, their spouses were military um, and and were exposed during military service. And um, it's amazing how you can flip a vote when you have um, 7, 12, 40 widows reaching out to their elected officials. It, it makes a difference. And and, and voices matter, but you have to put the pressure in the right place at the right time by the right people. Um, but maybe the story, the lesson here is that, um, for me anyway, is that it's not about me. I'm just the wrangler of the circus. Um, they don't want to hear from me. I mean, I will. I go in hard, especially for Michigan now that I, mm -hmm. I'm back living in Michigan. Um, you know, and it used to be I was in Maryland, so I just call the Maryland delegation. By the way, it's not really hard to get the Maryland delegation to vote the way you want them to. Um, <laughs> there's only one holdout. Um, but, but you know, like they don't want to hear from me. That's not my story. They want to hear from our community, and so I just try to make those connections. And uh, that's that's where I be. I will always tilt at windmills, but now I'm I'm more like pointing at the windmill and telling people go tilt there. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's a privilege to do the work. Um, you know, in, in retrospect, I probably should have gone to med school, at least got in a nursing degree so that I'd have a better understanding of the science. Um, I would do my best, but it's a, it, it mesothelioma is one of the most complicated cancers. And that's why there's so few experts and why there are so few, tre few treatments because it's super hard. But we are hopeful and we keep funding research to try and find answers. Well, let's, uh, well, speaking of answers and speaking of the fact that it's not about you knowing all the science, but being able to tell and share the story of who you're, who you're really um, 
targeting who you're really affecting and how you can make their lives better or their family's lives better. Um, so what do you feel is the biggest mis misconception about what you do? I think that unless you have been an executive director of a nonprofit organization, you have no idea how many hats we wear in a given day. We have to be experts in everything. Um, tech, accounting, personnel and HR, um, congressional budgets, the Department of Defense, um, enough science to be effective, um, the mental health needs of our community, um, the support needs of our community, the mental health and support needs of our staff, um, I, I, running an office just in general. Um, I, yeah, it's, it's never ending. Um, I've got contract negotiations I'm in the middle of with an institution of higher learning about a research grant. Um, I have to review reports from doctors on um, what their accomplishments are on previously funded research. I'm helping edit a proposal now for federal funding, and I'm serving as a grant reviewer for another federal funding project. You know, it, the list goes on and on. And then, but the thing that takes the most sort of mental and emotional bandwidth for me is managing our volunteers from our board to our science advisory board to our community advisory board um, to a merry band of volunteers who help us manage our social media groups. We have private Facebook groups for patients, caregivers, and the bereaved. So we, you know, it's, you know, and then, oh yeah, and support groups, you know, we run support groups. So it's never ending. Um, my to-do list is never to done. And um, <laughs> the areas in which I am, required to have expertise is unending. And when you run a small organization, I mean, right now we're a team of four. Um, in two weeks, uh, we go to a team of six. But you know what? Bringing new people on board, it means that I got more work to do. Um, so the hours are long um, and the work is hard, but I mean, it's worth it in the end. But the things that I'm supposed to be expert in are endless. And um, you can't delegate that away and you have budgets to meet. So there's no way I can, you know, just hire it done by someone else. So the buck stops at my desk and it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard um, balance between the needs of the community and the needs of our volunteers, the needs of our funders, the needs of our donors, the require the reporting requirements. Oh yeah. Don't get me started on the district of Columbia and the state of Ohio. I got issues, um, <laughs> but it just no, never ends. No comment. Like I'm switching, I'm switching banks right now. And it's, it's I'm, the amount of things I've signed my name to. I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I signed away one of my dogs, you know, <laughs> I'm kidding. Nobody wants them except for maybe you. Um, no, yeah. no, I, you're I, like, no, no, I, no. I under, no, I, I, the dogs I'll take switching <laughs> banks again. No, I completely <laughs> feel you on that. I had to do that a couple. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Uh, I'm good. I'm good where I'm at yep. for a long time, but yep. Speaking of um, all the things that you just mentioned that you have you have to pay attention to and um, you know, community staff, your constituents, the yeah, the government, what do you do for you? I mean, how do you get away? What do you do to escape or decompress from all this hard work? Because you gotta have to yep. you have to have opportunities for a break. What are what is your break? Well, I just mentioned, you know, part one, which are my dogs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have Maggie, who's the OG, and I have a new dog named Millie, um, who is a rescue. Um, and of course, they're both rescues. But so I spend a lot of time with my dogs and um, I am very lucky and very grateful to have a pretty tight group of very close friends um, who um, we've always been friends. I don't even know. I stopped counting at a decade. But, um, you know. We we formed a cocktail crew during the pandemic, <laughs> um, and uh, even though I was in Maryland and everybody else was here, we were able to stay together. Um, but you know, honestly, um, you know, I have great friends. I have a therapist who I adore. Um, I have, um, you know, I have hobbies and things that I'm into, um, and that I enjoy doing. Um, and uh, you know, I just bought a house, and I think many people who own a house will tell you that it is both awesome. <laughs> to have a super big backyard for my girls. Um, and it's also terrible because it's a hundred year old house and there's always something wrong with it. 
Um, but I'm also excited because I'm back in Michigan. I'm back in Lansing, um, working virtually. We have our organization's gone fully virtual and it gives me the opportunity to do some of the things that I love here in Lansing. Um, I get to spend time with my family because they're here. Um, but also I get to get back and volunteer with the things that I have always loved. So um, you hear it for here first. Um, Recycle Rama is April 22nd, Saturday. <laughs> I'm wrangling volunteers. Um, for those of you who remember back in the day, yeah, you're getting a phone call pretty soon. And um, it's going to be a great event. And uh, apologies, my Millie has decided that she just needs to have mommy pets. So I'm over here petting her too. But no, it's it's great to get back in the community. Um, I'm kind of hoping I can do Dragon Boat again this year, um, get my team back together. And uh, yeah, and I'm hoping once the weather gets better, I can start hiking, which I love. So, well, on that note, we will not keep you from that because our show is over. Julie, cool. thank you very much for being um, on the podcast. We really appreciate it. If anybody wants to know more about Julie and Julie's organization, what, uh, where can they find you? I decided to wear it on camera. It's curemiso.org, C-U-R-E-M-E-S-O.org. If you Google mesothelioma, you're going to run into page after page of lawyers. So that's not where you want to go. You want to go to curemiso.org. Awesome. And thank you, everybody, for tuning again and taking some time to listen to this program. So don't miss the next episode coming out in a couple of weeks. And if there is someone that you know uh, that you would like to hear about their journey, please email us at missioncontrol at introduce.com. And if this, this is your first time here, please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platform and give us a positive review. And until next time, catch us in the control center. Have a good day.